We're joined by Stephanie Roth, Wolf Research Chief Economist, and Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting Founder and former Federal Reserve Board Economist. A big welcome to you both here. So, Claudia, I want to start with you in terms of expectations. We weren't expecting any sort of big changes from the Fed off of just one report. Does this sort of add any credence to the fact that they can still afford to hold steady at, at this time and really push the rate cuts a little bit further out? Well, whether or not it's a good policy, um, Fed Chair Jay Powell has told us March is off the table, right? So they want nine months of good data. This one report is not going to necessarily push them off. And frankly, this is going to look a lot better in the personal consumption expenditure index, which is their target. It puts a lot less weight on uh, the shelter. And we saw medical care was a contributor, and a lot of that actually comes from the producer price index. So we're going to continue to see a wedge between CPI and PCE. And the Fed's told us they want a lot more data. You know, So they're going to wait. They got some data today. They got some things to think about. <laughs> Indeed. Stephanie, I want to bring you in here as well. I mean, you think about this data-dependent Fed, and at what point they would need to see a, a significant shift or at least a long enough trend, perhaps, in order to shift their own pathway as well. What, what would you be watching for and what does this data do for that broader trend? Well, I think it's important to note that January print has had seasonality issues. So it is possible that we'll see a, a, a notable deceleration in February and March months. That's actually what we were calling for. We are expecting uh the the seasonality to add about a tenth to the print and, and it seems like that might be the case services in particular you tend to get annual uh price increases that tend to go into effect in the month of january and the seasonals just don't appear to be picking that up yet we've seen this for the past couple of years that january tends to be a bit hotter than what's the underlying trend so our base case is certainly you know marches off the, off the ta table like claudia said uh our base case is that they're going to be cutting in, in june they want to see a little bit more data they want to see the year over year uh, CPI print come down closer to 2%, which will will need another couple of months in order to get there. And Claudia, I know that the, obviously the Fed hyper-focused on that 2% uh, inflation data, but obviously a lot of this, this is lagging data. So when you look at the strength of the labor market, when you combine that in, how much credence does that give to the cost to the economy of doing too much versus too little right now? Well, I mean, the Fed is really rolling the dice on the U.S. labor market. And they're leaning on it saying, hey, we have the luxury of time. The labor market is strong. And yet that doesn't necessarily have to go forward. And we saw in 2023 a strong labor market, a strong GDP growth, and lots of disinflation. So this idea that the two are linked together and there's a trade-off, at this point, we ought to be really putting a lot less weight on that. And, you know, they have a dual mandate, getting inflation low and also keeping unemployment low. And, you know, both sides of the mandate, they matter. And so with that in mind, does it does it feel like, because we've continued to hear that, Claudia, higher for longer is what investors should be getting used to, what the markets should start to price in. But there's a lot of over-exuberance, as, as Steve Bakliuka was telling us yesterday. And so ultimately, do you believe that higher for longer is, is something that the Fed is doing a good job of, of actively communicating and that the markets actually get it? Well, sometimes we don't hear what we don't want to hear, right? <laughs> I th and I think the Fed, you know, has multiple times Jay Powell has gone out and really beat it into people's heads, no march. And finally, the markets listen. Now, I'll say the Fed is data driven. I mean, I think they're more backward looking than they should be because monetary policy works forward with lags. And yet the Fed will respond to reality, right? So they will take on board if the disinflation comes faster than they think. They also said, we're not going to wait until 2% to do our first cut. So they're going to have to get going at some point this year. But it's really all about the inflation data. At least that's what the Fed has put emphasis on. And Stephanie, what are you watching in terms of the stickier parts of the inflation picture and how much of that you think you know, the, the markets are, are pricing in and sort of the domino effect for the economy? Yeah, I mean, service is, is for sure the, the stickier parts, and that's what's linked to the labor market. But we've seen wage inflation come down. We expect that to continue to be the case, and that should have its effect on, on services prices just with a lag. So we should start to see that the services components continue to slow down. Um, we very much expect shelter prices to, to slow down from here. Uh, I think some of this was seasonal noise in the January print. But you're seeing real-time measures of rent coming quite soft. You have a lot of multifamily supply coming back online. So, so that part of the, the services basket should very much continue to decelerate this year. And then it's just a matter of the, the, the wage data continuing to soften, which will, will filter its way into services. 
And, and how actively, Stephanie, do we expect that wage data to continue to soften? Um, I mean, now I would say the, the, the trend in wage inflation is roughly 4%. I think we'll get down closer to that 3.5% towards the, the, the middle to end part of this year, which, you know, if, if we continue to see another ECI print that's similar to what we saw in Q4, the Fed should feel a lot more comfortable about where wage inflation is today. The, the, the ECI print was actually very close to, to in line with the, the wage print that's, that's consistent with the Fed's 2% mandate. They're looking for wage inflation somewhere around 3.5%. And, and so far, the, the, at least the most recent data has been consistent with that. Average hourly earnings are, are quite a bit more noisy, uh, and, and I would put a lot more weight on the ECI. So, Claudia, then, as you're looking at the potential for the, the worst outcome here for the Fed, staying too restrictive until something breaks versus inflation, the risk of inflation reaccelerating, um, what do you think is the bigger risk? And really, how should the Fed modeling be adapted to the realities of what we're seeing in the lagged data versus the actual data? So the Fed sees the biggest risk as the reseller, um, inflation coming back up, even if it doesn't come up that much because they have set multiple Federal Reserve officials, what they see as the worst outcome is the Fed starts cutting gradually, and then they have to raise interest rates because the inflation picks up. Personally, I think the worst possible outcome is they go until they break something, whether it's something in financial markets or in the labor market, because frankly, the Fed, there's been many cases of them doing quote unquote adjustments where they have to kind of switch direction. So, but they have made clear that, that they do not want to cut and then have to raise. So they're really afraid of that inflation kind of popping back up. You know, Claudia, as I'm, as I'm looking through some of the other items within this reading, it, it seems that services are still largely running hot here. How, how long do we expect that to be the case here versus goods and the spending there that a, a lot of people have perhaps gotten a little bit more value conscious about or tried to have some value hacks that they implement? I think we have to remember there's pieces in there that are contracts that aren't really tied to the current wage growth. Shelter is one that we've talked a lot about because it takes time for those rents to come through. Another one that keeps getting cited is the motor vehicle insurance. Mm -hmm. Again, that is one that takes time to work its way through. It had to see the auto prices come down. So you've got some of these things that are put in the sticky part of inflation really aren't about the wages and it's just gonna just take time to work those contracts out. Now I don't want to like, you know, dismiss what we're seeing in services all over, but there is a part of it that we just gotta stop thinking, oh, all of this uh, services is somehow tied to the labor market. And, and Stephanie, do you see that same dynamic as well? We're watching the 10-year the uh, retreating here after, after that CPI data coming out. A lot of people, you know, looking at some of these, these stickier aspects of housing and especially rents. Yeah, I mean, well, if you look at the, the print that we just saw, the, the measure of rent actually decelerated a bit, but owner's equivalent rent picked up. Um, I, this, this is a, a piece of the, the inflation basket that I feel really good about continuing to slow down. As Claudia mentioned, it's really, really lagged. So we don't have a we don't have a sense, at least in the in the terms of how the data are reported, that's not based on what's happening real time. So through through the throughout the course of this year, we should very much see owners' equivalent rent and rent continue to slide down. But it, it does make sense that the the market is not looking at this report favorably, in part because you know the the, the Fed is so dependent on each each CPI print, um, and it's hard to decipher what is seasonal effects and what's actually happening on the ground. Our base case is that. In the next couple of months, the, the inflation data should look a lot cooler than what, where it is today. Claudia, we know the Fed typically has some sensitivity around cutting during a, a general election cycle. Uh, are we at the point where that could be the reality that we're headed towards? The Fed wanting to seem apolitical, but still at the same time needing to implement potential cuts later on this year, while there is, of course, the campaigning that is taking place and all the way up and through November. It's going to be a painful year for the Fed. I mean, they're already getting it on all sides that, you know, if they cut, if they don't cut in terms of what it's going to do to the economy. The Fed is used to always getting blamed for whatever happens. This year is just going to be more intense. It is not a partisan institution. They are not going to put a thumb on the scale for either candidate. And it should not get in the way of when they cut or when they don't cut. But again, you're not going to be able to tell, right? They're going to be making decisions in an election year and people are going to point fingers at them. And yet knowing the institution, knowing the Fed chair, Jay Powell, they're just going to, you know, put their heads down and do their job. 
Indeed. And so, Stephanie, what are you watching in terms of the potential upsides for the Fed, perhaps outside of what the Fed is in control of, that could also contribute to what's going to be happening with inflation in the coming quarter? One big thing is this potential tax deal that might happen this year. Um, the, the House already passed it. It's very possible that the Senate will, will do that, too. And that can be a, a pretty big stimulus for the economy this year. We're looking at about $136 billion of, of gross stimulus added to the economy, which could, in, in our estimates, could boost GDP by about 0.3%. So if that actually comes in, in into fruition, that could just be another upside su surprise for, for growth this year. But as we, as we did see last year, you, you, you can see fairly strong GDP growth with inflation continuing to come back down, which is our base case. Um, but there, there definitely appears to be more upside risk to the economy uh, than downside the way we see it. We'll certainly continue to track that. Appreciate you both for joining us. Stephanie Roth, Wolf Research Chief Economist, and Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting Founder and former Federal Reserve Board Economist. Appreciate you taking the time today.